、えー、次は特別公演です、えー、特別公演,、えー、公演はオードリー・タンさんにお話しいただきます、えー、テーマはデジタルソーシャルイノベーションです、えー、オードリーさんは台湾のソーシャルイノベーション担当のデジタル大臣でいらっしゃいます、えー、コロナ禍における取り組みで世界から注目を浴びています彼女が推し進めるオープンイノベーションその成功の秘訣として彼女は透明性とユーモアを取り上げています国家企業のリスク管理の面でも非常に得るものがある講演です Our next session is special session digital social innovation Please welcome our speaker Audrey Tang Audrey please start Hello Really happy to be here virtually to share with you some thoughts about digital innovation, uh, especially in the time of Corona. Uh, and here is my mask, wearing a mask, hand sanitation. These are the most important technologies. It's like a physical vaccine, but digital technologies also helps on a assistive fashion. In Taiwan, we we're talking about digital social innovation. We talk about the three things that is fast, fair, and fun. The last part is the collective intelligence. As you know, in Taiwan, we have this idea of collective intelligence of the wisdom at the edge, meaning that the people who know the most about any emergent situation is actually just the citizens in the Taiwanese equivalent of Reddit, which we call the PTT. The PTT is not for profit, it's maintained by the National Taiwan University. And last December, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, posted that there's seven new SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market here, it gets reposted by No More Pipe, a young doctor in PTT immediately. And then not only did we uh, email the World Health Organization, but the very next day, all our medical officers started health inspections for all the passengers from Wuhan to Taiwan. And so this shows that in a complete freedom open society where the freedom of expression, of press, of assembly is preserved, we have a head start. Unlike Dr. Li Wenliang, which gets harmonized uh, by the Wuhan institutions, uh, he actually saved everybody in Taiwan because we acted early based on the collective intelligence. And that shows that the citizens trust the government will not repress this kind of whistleblowing and the government trusts the citizens to come up with the upvotes based on scientific understanding and by vetting the intelligence that came from Wuhan. So right afterward, we set up the Central Epidemic Command Center or the CECC with Minister Chen and the Panza. Now the CECC not only has a live press conference every 2 p.m. during the pandemic days, um, and we also have a toll free number 1922 that everybody can call and report anything to the SEC. So not only this answers all the people's questions when it comes to the science, but also people can call and say, for example, a young boy back in April called saying, hey, your rationing mask, oh, I get a pink medical mask. I don't want to wear to the school. My classmates will laugh at me. And because of that, um, well, the very next step, you can see here, all the medical officers wore pink medical masks. And that's very fast iteration cycle. So the boy become the most hip boy in the class because only he has the color that the heroes wear. The second pillar is called fairness. When we're rationing out the mask, we have a very clear goal. If we can start in early February and by March get three quarters of people wearing the mask and cleaning their hands. Then we know the basic transmission rate, the R value will be under one, meaning that the disease will not spread. So how can we get three quarter of people getting the masks? Well, we work with the civic technologists and also the pharmacists, more than 6,000 of them already trusted by their neighborhood because many elderly people go to the pharmacies to refill their prescriptions. We design the mask creation to work exactly the same as getting the refilled prescriptions. And the pharmacists, of course, divide their own ways by sharing their real-time numbers of the availability 
with civic technologies. So more than 100 tools enable you to see which pharmacy near them still have mask in stock and which has run out of stock of the day. And when you're queuing in the line, people queuing after you can refresh their phone and know that you have been in, if you're an adult, get nine medical masks for two weeks nowadays, or 10 if you are a child. So this is called participatory accountability. It's also enabled independent analysis of the real-time numbers. Imagine if we publish number only once a day, then people cannot participate in the auditing and people cannot analyze the unevenness in the distribution. But because we publish every 30 seconds, it's an open API. So people, for example, uh, MP Gao Hong and previously a VP of Foxconn working on data analytics, she asked Minister Chen, hey, according to the open street map analysis, while it looks fair uh, on the distance on the map, it's actually unfair if you take into account the time that people have to take on public transportation. And Minister did not uh, defend the policy at all. He just said, legislator, teach us. And then we immediately co-created the new design of the convenience store pickup system so everybody can pick up 24 hours a day in the nearby convenience store. You can see our premier, our head of cabinet, Su Zhenchang, smiling happily here because by uh, March, we not only hit the three-quarter target, but actually by April, when people can pick up from convenience store, more than 90% of people actually get the medical mask and can use it in a responsible fashion. And finally, the fun part. How do we make sure that in the time of pandemic, where panic buying, where the disinformation conspiracy theory constitutes a infodemic, how can we make sure the infodemic does not hurt the society? Well, we use this idea called humor over rumor. Basically, for any rumor, we introduce after two hours a very funny picture, less than 200 characters and with two funny pictures to make sure that people can share them. Even after they see the conspiracy theory, they will still laugh at our clarification. And the clarification will have a higher R value on social media and this information and conspiracy theories. For example, there was a time when people went out and panicked my tissue papers because there was a rumor that, and I quote, that all the tissue paper material are being confiscated to make medical masks. That's, of course, not true. So the head of cabinet, Premier Su Zhenchang, wrote out this within just a couple hours, saying in very large font that each of us only has one pair of bottom. It's a uh, homonym because in Mandarin, to stockpile, tuen, sounds the same as box, tuen. So by showing his background, and making himself literally the butt of the joke. Everybody uh, shared it, this went viral, and people see uh, this table that says the medical masks are made out of domestic materials, but the tissue papers are made out of the South American materials. So we don't confuse the two. And within a couple of days, the panic buying died down. And this is not just one shot. We use this for each and every scientific measures issued by the CECC. For example, there is a cute folks dog that says, when you're keeping a physical distance outdoor, please keep two Shiba Inu away. If you're indoor, keep three Shiba Inu away. Cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. Uh, and why do you wear a mask? Well, you wear a mask to protect yourself against your own unwashed hands. So this connects the mask use and soap use together. And this dog meme is far more viral than any panic buying or disinformation. That's how we remain calm and collected with the power of social innovation digitally in a time of pandemic. And this enabled us to now record uh, 200 days, actually more than 200 days, with no local transmission cases. If you want to learn more, feel free to ask on Fido, and there's also a website and Taiwan can help that us. So that's my 10 minute pitch. Thank you for listening.
So I think we're at the time of the Slido questions. Let's see. Ah, here you go. Uh, the Slido question here says, did the organizational security policies or the privacy rules get into the innovation this time around? If we have experience on how to overcome it, uh, please share it. That's a great question. First of all, we do not collect new data during the pandemic that's not already collected before the pandemic. And the idea is very simple, because if you collect new data, then people will ask, where do the data go? What's the data protection rules and so on? But for the data that's already collected before the pandemic, people already know how it interacts with the other parts of their data behavior. For example, when we're making sure that people who stay in quarantine for 14 days, we either ask them to go to a quarantine hotel physically, or they can also choose to remain at home if they have their own bathroom in their home. In the later case, if they break the quarantine, how would we know? Well, we ask them to put their phone, or if they don't have a phone, we give them a phone for two weeks into the digital fence. But we do not ask them to install an app or to uh, have a dongle or bracelet or turn on Bluetooth or anything, because those are new data collection methods. Instead, we talk to the five telecommunication operators. The telecoms already know where their phone is but in a very rough degree. In the urban area, maybe 50 meter radius. So it knows which block they are in, but not which room they are in. And people already understand when they're facing a earthquake, they can get a SMS directly asking them to uh, evacuate because uh, we have advanced earthquake warnings based on the telecom uh, signal strength triangulation and also uh, the earthquake prevention. We also have the same thing for flood and typhoon warnings. So we just change that system and send an SMS. If their phone breaks out of the quarantine area, then the SMS is sent to the local medical workers who will then check the person's whereabouts. If they stay in the quarantine for 14 days, then we pay them 100 US dollars a day to thank them for their effort. But if they break the quarantine, we find them um, a lot more, like 1,000 times that. So people don't break out of the quarantine, but we don't break the existing privacy norms either because people understand the triangulation and the SMS has no way to read their email or to control their phone or to turn on their GPS or inter their Bluetooth devices. So that is the basic idea of no new data collection. Um, another question asks, uh, what system issues in the security do you have to consider in implementing the COVID countermeasures? Security is not just about technological security. It's also about the feeling of the sense of trust the security in people's mind. So I will use an example. For example, there was a time where a person in an intimate drinking bar gets diagnosed with COVID. On the first day, she did not admit being a worker in such a nightlife place because she is a professional and anonymity is very important in their trade but it will very easily get into a point where people will uh, say that, oh, these nightlife are against our counter virus uh, rules. And this will then cause them to go underground because of the stigma. So our CECC did not invoke sanctions or put people in jail or fine them, but rather they introduced this idea of a real contact system based on their prior work with HIV plus communities. As long as people can be contacted, no real name was necessary. And so the CECC asked the businesses in the nightlife only keep 
in paper their contact numbers or emails, but those numbers do not need to be reported to the central government. And so the businesses develop creative approaches, code names, single use emails, prepaid SIM cards, hats with plastic shield to maintain social distancing. So they get reopened with the blessing of the municipalities. And when even nightclub can join the fight, then the security measures implemented at the edges is actually much more important to get people into the feeling of sense of safety and security than a top-down way that will drive them underground. So this decentralization and the trust of the government to the citizens, I think is even more important than any top-down measures of security. The next question asks, um, so uh, what kind of security engineers and hackers can help the uh, cross-border to make the world better? This is excellent question. Well, uh, the civic technologies in Tainan implemented the mass availability map. They did not ask for anyone's permission. It is not a government procurement. It is not something that we asked them to do. They just did it by themselves. And all I did is to get them the real-time open API and give them a GOV URL, a domain name, bless this, more than 100 of the civic technologies contributions in an official website. And so one month after that, uh, in early March, people in South Korea, in Seoul, agreed to convince their government that our API need to be used to make their mask rationing available. And so the first map that works in Korea was actually developed in Tainan city. Uh, when the author of Fin Jin Kyung wrote it out, we're very amazed because he doesn't speak Korean, but he speaks JavaScript. And the Korean civic hackers speak JavaScript. That's the important part. In a similar way, Code for Japan, which is uh, by Haru Seki-san uh, and his friends, implemented the Stop COVID dashboard for the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Not only the Taiwanese hackers helped translating and perfecting the system, I personally also um, participated in the proofreading and even corrected a typo by sending a pull request. So my suggestion is just to pu publish it on GitLab or GitHub, let everybody know about the work that you do. And before long, your solution will not only be local, it will be global as well. Um, so another question asks, so what about global um, issues? How can we contribute to the global systems? Well, you can uh, consult cohack, that's C-O-H-A-C-K, C -O -H -A -C -K dot T-W. There are five winning teams that are solving issues that are making sure that the global people, even um, when Taiwan has no need, for example, for the community tracing program, because we don't have community spread, we're still working with the entire world, um, uh, Factors such as the uh, visual storytelling to, uh, to uh, decision makers, that's called Gemini Explore, a distributed ledger based community awareness dashboard uh, is called Autonomy, uh, based on the uh, Bitmark technology, uh, and also a personalized diary keeping tool to facilitate contact tracing without sacrificing privacy. All this is something that the security engineers like you uh, who have the capability to look at the contact notification API, not only Google and Apple, but also by the European Union and so on. And we can work together to make sure that this does not encroach on the privacy. Another question also asks, what contribution can the security community provide in the measurements uh, that I talk about? We work closely with white hackers with penetration testers. So for example, in the COHAC system, we use something called POLIS, P-O-L dot I-S. It's an AI system 
that ask everybody around the world what's acceptable when it comes to counter pandemic, what's not acceptable. And we focus only to solve problems that have rough consensus among all the countries that participated. So we're now working with a security research firm, uh, the name is DEPCOR, uh, to harden the security of the POLIS system so we can use it more in the future, not only counter pandemic, but anything that require cross-cultural, international, rough consensus, listening at scale. So if you're interested in that, you can also look at the security profiles of POLIS, of Sandstorm, of all the different tools that we use during the counter pandemic and file some CVEs if you detect um, vulnerabilities in those open systems because they are all open source under the GPL license. Uh, your CVEs will be uh, seen by many across all the jurisdictions and also will be for all your country. So focus on the open source components of our toolkits and make sure that uh, do the penetration testing, uh, and we can talk about uh, your CVEs and we can contribute to fix them in real time. That's all the uh, final questions, and we still have a few minutes. I don't know if the moderator would like to ask me something or to share something. All right. If there is no uh, more questions on Slido, uh, I will just uh, remind you again uh, to wear your mask and to wash your hands. The mask is here to protect ourselves from our own unwashed hands. While the um, physical distance between our friends and families may be temporarily isolated, the digital world has brought us even closer thanks to video conferencing and Slido. If you want to make sure that your contribution gets to be amplified by your government, maybe you can share this with them. It's the Pygmalion effect. The more the government trusts the citizens, including people in the nightlife, the more citizens become trustworthy. If the government from top-down measure doesn't trust the citizens, then citizens, of course, become not trustworthy. This is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the government can start with one very simple principle, is to trust the citizens more. Um, thank you for listening, and thank you for people on Slido, who says that, uh, like the rainbow mask, uh, and um, the direction of the innovation in Taiwan is open. By open, we not only mean transparent and participatory, but as you have heard in my conversation in the 1922 in the toll free number, it must also be accountable. I love the Japanese translation of the accountability. It's translated as the ability to give an account to uh, the ability to explain clearly. So think about the ways to scale listening, but also think about when you listen, how quickly is it every day, is it every week, that you can absorb the collective intelligence and amplify the best practices. Our mass rationing system gets weekly um, improvements thanks to the pharmacists that call 1922 and let us know how to improve it in terms of take a number of system, in terms of alternate queuing system, in terms of automated billing system, and finally the convenience store pre-order. And also it makes sure that the innovation doesn't stop when we stop working on it. The citizen developers can all come up with their own ways like a vending machine in the Taipei city uh, and that totally also improved people's willingness to try out this new mask printing tools. I think we are uh, at time, so I will answer the last uh, question from Slido, asking uh, what kind of uh, culture from Japan do I like? Um, 
my um, Instagram, which is called Digital Minister, uh, all lowercase Digital Minister. Uh, it's the same uh, on uh, my Facebook as well. Uh, and if you check out my Instagram, you will see a video where I play the character of Dora Emil. And to me, AI stands for assistive intelligence. And Dora Emil symbolizes the idea of alignment and accountability. For Dora Emil always aligns with the human society's best practices. It's not about terminator. It's not about eliminating any enemies. Doraemon never does that. But rather, Doraemon shows the possible futures to the community and then also show the possible drawbacks. But at the end, how to apply it is up for the humans to make the judgments. And so not only is the alignment accountable, but also it's fun as well. It's very uh, lovely. It's more. Um, it's very cute. So the cuteness and uh, the assistive nature of the assistive intelligence in the Japanese culture, I think, is very, very important, especially in this time and day where we're working with more smart than ever cities that we need smarter citizens. And in this, Taiwan and Japan are very much aligned, and we should work together. So thank you for listening uh, and live long and prosper.